What's up, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can help this show to grow while also getting access to our exclusive Pride content, which includes shows like Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, Special Interviews, Lions of Liberty Roundtables, and much, much more. So check that out. Help us grow at lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. Oh, yeah. Konnichiwa, everybody. Or I should say, Ohio Gozaimus, depending on when you are listening to this. This is Brian McWilliams. I am back from Japan. I have returned triumphant. I don't know exactly what I triumphed over. I guess I, I, I triumphed over my liver. I gave it a real run for its money, and I'll get into a little bit of that. I want to talk a little bit about my Japan trip before I uh, delve into other things. But uh, before I do, I want to tell you guys this is episode 68. Yes, Electric Liberty Land, episode 68, which means you can find it at Lions of Liberty. Well, it and all the show notes at lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL68. So you can find all the story links there. And uh, again, at the top of the show, guys, I do want to uh, to give a quick shout out to an event that we're going to be having coming up again. We uh, we did one with uh, Jason Stapleton and Dave Smith. Uh, we did our Liberty Meetup group, Liberty Behind the Lines, in conjunction with Liberty on the Rocks. And I want to give them a shout out because we're going to be doing another one of those upcoming on May 5th in Hollywood. So I will uh, see if there's a link available to that yet. But if not, keep posted. I will post one. But we're going to be doing another Liberty Meetup group, which was awesome the last time. There had to be about 150 people there. This time with Scott Horton. So it's going to be interesting to see if I can get a word in. (laughs) Because I love Scott. But man, that dude can talk. And God knows, I'm sure if we get a few drinks in him, he'll be talking and talking. So that'll be a fun time. So uh, I'll keep you posted on that. I'm going to see if I can post a show or a link to the show notes to RSCP for that event as well. And uh, yeah, so anywho, as you know, I talked about a few times. I was over in Japan, went to uh, Tokyo with my wife, then went to a little bit in Kyoto, went to Mount Fuji, traveling around. And, you know, very clean country, at least the places I was. And it's the strangest thing. Because you get there, you're walking around, right? You buy a, maybe you buy a snack, maybe you buy a drink. You know, you're walking around. You can walk around with a beer there. They don't, they don't really mind too much. And uh, <laughs> you go, you finish your drink up and you go, well, let me throw this can away like a good citizen would do. And you look around and there's no trash cans anywhere. It's a barren trash canless world. So you're like, okay, what the fuck am I going to do with this thing? Well, there's not any trash cans in like bus stations. There's not any on the street corners. There's not any in restaurants you can use. And you're just, you just got to hold it. And I eventually found a Japanese person that spoke uh, fluent English. And I said, what's the deal with the trash cans, man? I don't see any trash around, but yet I don't see any trash cans. That seems like a complete mystery to me. I mean, how are these, how, how can these two things be happening at once? And he told me, he goes, well, you know what actually happens is the mayor of Tokyo. And uh, this was followed, I guess, by Kyoto. And I don't know how many other cities, but mayor of Tokyo was like, you know, these trash cans are putting around to make life easier for our citizens. Well, they're overflowing oftentimes with uh, trash. And especially in Japan, because by the way, in Japan, if you've never been, they've got a little, you know, like a kiosk, uh, vending machine kiosk thing with different sodas or different snacks, ice creams, all that stuff. There's one like every 10 feet. So people are constantly buying and drinking these canned beverages. So I can imagine that, yeah, the trash cans probably would overflow after well. But instead of having, you know, more services put in place, the guy just goes, you know what? Forget it. Get rid of the trash cans. See you later. <laughs> Sayonara trash cans. So got rid of them throughout the city. Told people, put that shit in your pocket. Take it home. Throw it out there. And, you know, in, in a society like ours, at least where I live in Los Angeles, the dirtiest city in the world, people just throw it on the ground. I'm not going to categorize this to any specific people, but let's just say in general, people live here like to throw trash on the ground in front of my apartment, in front of Brian's apartment. Come on over, guys. If you're ever in L.A., drive down Culver Boulevard, throw some trash in front of my apartment because God knows people love to do it. But in Tokyo, they don't. They keep it in their pockets. And, you know, at, at first glance, you're like, 
Well, that seems, you know, pretty effed up to make people carry around trash with them. I mean, put a trash can out. You're like, You've got the city, the taxes, but I like it. You know why? Because that's one less expense. Personal responsibility. I like that. Personal responsibility. You take your trash, you bring it home with you, you throw it out. Don't expect the government to take it for you. Don't expect the government's people to come and cart your trash away. Take it home with you and take care of it yourself. It's your responsibility. You're a big boy. You can handle it. So good on that, Japan. Another thing I liked when I was over there. So, like I said, I was kicking the crap out of my liver. And uh, one of the reasons I did that, or one of the ways in which I did that, was going out to this district called the Golden Guy. And it's spelled G-A-I. It wasn't like some place you go where men of the evening just pee on you. Though, where this area was actually did happen to be a former area where they had a lot of prostitution. So this golden guy area, though, as it turned out, so basically what it was, used to be prostitution. It's a bunch of very narrow streets, maybe 10 feet wide streets, not even, maybe eight feet wide. And every 10 feet, there's a little stairwell or a little door and you go in and it's a tiny little bar about the size of this bedroom I'm recording in, in my quote unquote studio. I mean, literally, it's like the size of your bathroom at home, probably. And you go in, there's a guy that, that works there, and also oftentimes they live there. They live right above the uh, right above the bar. And you can see the little ladder, you can see the little hatch that the guy lives in. So anyway, you go to these bars and uh, you know, they've got all these different types. They've got the not sinister bar, which is run by a monk. I mean, legit, like a guy dresses up as a monk every single night. There's another bar uh, run by Abi Chan, who which is called Bar Asylum or Bar A S L Y. All you know, 60 scotches, and these guys. There's actually there was one we went, we met our friends there. We overlapped with them for a night and uh, went up to this one bar. And it's just an old guy in there. The room is just filled with old instruments and like stuffed animals. That was it. Guitars, old pianos, a uh, an iMac, like the original iMac from 1999. And just drank some beer, had some whiskey in there. <laughs> and it's literally like a little, little attic room. And you're just hanging out with the dude in there. There was room for literally five of us, including him. And it's just awesome. So I got completely obliterated, including going to a karaoke bar. You got to do some karaoke. And uh, side tangent, ran into this British expat there, right? Expat's sitting out there. He's teaching in Japan now. He's teaching history. I figured you'd be teaching another language, but I guess they don't care. And this guy, we're getting along pretty well. But then, my God. Turned out to be the biggest statist shill. I mean, God, this fucking guy had the biggest inferiority complex about USA beating the Brits in the Revolutionary War. He, I mean, he could not get over it. And then he's like, ah, oh, you guys, you know, you lot, yeah, you just out uh, dregs, you know, you, yeah, you, you think you're hot shit. You ain't nothing, mate. You ain't nothing. It's like, dude, I don't give a fuck. As I told him, I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm a libertarian. I don't give a shit about your state of shit. If you want to identify yourself with the British monarchy and uh, and live your life by that rule, then go ahead. But fuck off. I don't need to hear about it. Leave me alone. I got a karaoke to sing over here. Anyway, tangent over. So back to the general golden guy. But what, what really amazed me, though, is that these people could open these bars. And I apologize. I have been running ragged. Uh, I wanted to research this a little bit more, and I just didn't have time today. And <laughs> and it's a funny story why i'll tell you that too okay i'm gonna just do, give you a bunch of bullshit today before i even get into anything having to do with liberty but so this golden guy district though all these guys they live in these houses they live in these little tiny apartments and they're running them like bars and they're, and, and it's, it doesn't look like it's no credit cards it's cash only so you know they're not reporting any of this i mean maybe a, a smidgen of it is going to get reported to the government so i'm looking i go i wonder how this is operating i mean is it licensed i don't think it's licensed it certainly doesn't seem to be licensed. Otherwise, you know, anybody that moves in, you'd have to, I guess you move into the apartment. Does it just come with a liquor license? Because in LA, they cost about $150,000 to get. And there's very few that are available. Full liquor licenses, that is. They limit them because LA likes to limit everything and just completely ruin everybody's, everybody's day. Everybody's good time gets ruined in Los Angeles. But that really shocked me and blew me away. Because I was like, that's awesome. I mean, especially when you compare it to a city like L.A. or like San Francisco or like New York, where you've got real estate at such a ridiculous prime, where there's no way for an average person to want to open a bar. You could never do it. Never in a million years, unless you had an incredibly huge bank loan. And you better have some goddamn massive collateral to be able to put that up. 
So to be able to say, okay, I'm just going to open up a little speakeasy bar in my apartment, or I'm going to rent an apartment and turn that into a bar. I mean, I wonder, is it zoned just that specific area? You could open up anywhere in that zone. I mean, I just don't know. And I really want to, I'm going to dive into it. And hopefully I'll remember to do it for next show because I just think it's absolutely fascinating. And again, this is what it should be. This is how it should operate. If you want to run a bar out of your house, you should be able to do it. You're selling beer. Great. You're not making your own whiskey, which again, I'd be fine with. (laughs) If I'm for people selling raw milk, I'm for people selling moonshine. But let's just say, let's keep it a little bit more in the realm of what could be reasonable tomorrow if politicians get their heads out of their asses. You say, okay, you're selling bottled beer. You're selling beer on tap, although most of it was just bottled. I think probably maybe that was part of the rule. You had to have it bottled. But all these people just have it pre-made, sling it out of their houses. They put their own prices on it, which was very affordable. Japan overall, to me, was affordable because living in L.A., everything's expensive. So it's fairly cheap. But I mean, God damn it, man. Cottage industry. Just like if you want to open a restaurant out of your house, you should be allowed to. If, just, if you want to run a food truck, you should be allowed to. If you want to have a little stand on the side of the road and sell shit, you should be able to. Rather than have the cops... Come kick your goddamn lemonade stand over if your kid wants to make money for his Cub Scout troop. So in that regard, kudos to Japan. Now, at the same time, Japan is a very, very regulated industry uh, as far as many things are concerned. Let's, I'll I'll use the most egregious example, of course. You know, the one thing I cannot abide in Japan is the fact that the government censors all their porn. I, I, why? Why? You can see the boobs, but you can't see the vagina. You can't see the butthole. Are are we? Are, are, why are we children? Children shouldn't be watching porn anyway. So we're going to punish the the adults that watch the porn to save the children. Is that the concept they're going for with the pixelated porn? They even they even pixelate the animated porn. <laughs> I that's that is a step too far, and I. For the life of me, I don't understand why in the world you would expect that to work. Meanwhile, you look at Japan as some of the highest suicide rates of any country in the world. And uh, look, I'm no scientist. I'm no psychologist. But I got to think not being able to see the vagina of the woman you're jerking off to in the porn probably has a little something to do with it. It's just my two cents. But that's an exa- another example of just the the sublime of uh, this barely regulated district of the golden guy area where people can open up these small businesses and the ridiculous of the government forcing you to pixelate your porn that people use in the very own homes that harm nobody. And in fact, I would argue that porn actually helps to keep people from being harmed because it gives people an outlet to, uh, to work out their, their sexual desires in privacy rather than going out and assaulting somebody or hashtag me tooing anybody. Anyway, so that was Japan. Uh, no, I'm not going to bore you with any more details. I have some other little things I'm going to share with our uh, pride group that are a little little bit more uh, rough around the edges. But, you know, you got to pay for that. <laughs> you got to pay for the privilege of that stuff, guys. So I did mention I'm, uh, I'm exhausted. I'm short on time again. I'm running ragged. So I got back from Japan. Had to go straight through to Vegas for a couple of days for this big trade show called the National Association of Broadcasters Show. And as soon as I get back from that... I got to jump into this uh, charity clan I work with, which I've mentioned on the show before, called CASA, which is Court Appointed Special Advocates. Now, their local branch in L.A. is having their big gala event, and uh, I am in charge of doing all the publicity for it and running the red carpet and getting the celebrities to come who, God, getting celebrities to come, man. I don't know what you got to do. Put out a plate of diamonds and uh, and and shrimp or something like that and lure them in. Put out diamonds and... <laughs> And uh, photo photo ops of the cover of People magazine, like luring in uh, like the Reese's Pieces for Mac and Me, the greatest movies ever made. So anyway, got, came back, had to deal with all that, and, and I got home late today, and I wanted to, I wanted to have a good two and a half hours to uh, to record this podcast because I feel bad for giving you guys a short shrift the last couple episodes, but I uh, I had to go over. I arranged an interview with Kathy Hilton and Paris Hilton and Nikki Hilton. Of the Hilton clan. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with them. So they're going to be honored at this event, and uh, they're the big draw. So Access Hollywood's going over, and by the interview will have, will have aired, I think, later tonight. So if you're listening to this on Wednesday, it airs on Access Hollywood tonight. You can check it out. But talking about their charity work and this organization, which is great. The only thing is, 
Interviews, uh, you know, it starts to start about five o'clock. I get there at three thirty. I pull in. I'm parked in behind you know, in, the, in the big mansion, and they've got this big wraparound driveway. And I pull off to the side because I know I don't want to stay for this whole interview, right? I want to get home. I want to give you guys the good liberty talk you deserve, a good breakdown of the issues. I want to get good and riled up for you. So at five o'clock when the interview starts, I'm like, all right, man, I got to get out of here. You guys can handle it from here. You know, you're all set. I'll see you later. And I waved to everybody. Like, goodbye. Goodbye, Hilton. I like saying goodbye to Nikki Hilton. I'm like, thanks a lot. I'll see you later. So, <laughs> so I'm walking outside. Uh, like, I get some water. So I'm walking outside. And as soon as I step out the front door, and, and let, me, let, me, let me give you a little example with the, the way the house is set up, too, because this plays into the story. So when you walk in the house, there's a big foyer. There's a room to the left, like a dining parlor. That's where they're doing the interview. So it's right there on the foyer, right? So you can't walk in and out without being seen. And you're, and they're shooting it with the, the Hiltons on a couch, and behind them is the foyer. So you can't walk back and forth without being seen in the shot, which means they have to stop the whole interview and start over. So I go in, I go out, and I come right back in because I realize my car is completely blocked in. I'm in this giant driveway, but the part I, th- I thought I'd be able to leave at is blocked off with someone's Range Rover, which turned out to be Paris's, actually, and <laughs> parked right in the middle. And uh, then somebody had pulled in behind me, blocking me in so I couldn't reverse. So I'm like, God damn it. So I turn around, go back in the house. And I go to the room where uh, my contact, her, her manager was hanging out and a few other people to say, hey, who, whose car is this? Can we move it? Open that door. Room's empty. So now I have no option. I don't want to go Marco Poloing around this house to be like, where is everybody, guys? Where'd you go? Are you guys in the bathroom? Are you in the Hilton's bathroom? Are you in the Hilton's bedroom? Are you under the Hilton's carpet? Should I look under the carpet? So I'm like, fuck. So, so I, I had no other option than to slink back out and then it sit in my car with my phone, which was dead. I, I had no phone charger. I left it on my, I, I brought on my trip, didn't plug it back into my car. So I had no phone. I sat in my car, turning it on and off, letting the, <laughs> letting the engine run so the battery wouldn't die, listening to baseball on Sirius XM. And, uh, and an hour later, I finally got to leave. And that's how I escaped the trap of the Hilton family's parking. I know, it's an amazing story. So anyway, now I'm drinking a martini and yelling into a microphone. And I've spent 17 minutes talking about approximately nothing, which is pretty good. Pretty good for me. So let's get into a a topic. Let's do some Syria before I go into a commercial break. Let's do a little Syria talking. What do you think? And I know a lot of people have talked about Syria, but I got to get it. I got to get a little bit of Syria. I got to take a bite out of the Syria apple because it's just so absurdly ridiculous. It's so insane that it's insane that we're bombing them right now. I mean, we launched something like 130 more Tomahawk missiles. We took out three of their chemical weapon sites. And as was pointed out in an email at our email chain, which, uh, you know, you guys, if you subscribe to the pride for $15, you get all the email links that we get every day from our good uh, Howie, our intelligence officer for Liberty, the godfather of Liberty, Howie Snowden, sends out every day. But we're talking about these links, and he points out, he goes, you know what I just realized? The U.S. just bombed three of these quote-unquote chemical weapon sites before any of the U.N. inspectors could get in there. So who knows if they even had anything? These are alleged chemical weapon sites. And remember, we still have the first chemical ass- attack by Assad, a- alleged. Mattis even admitted there's actually no evidence for it. There's zero evidence linking Assad to that that gassing of his own people. So that's why we bombed them the first time, even though we gave Russia a heads up. So that was asinine the first time we did it. And now, knowing that there's no evidence, knowing that Trump just said that he's going to pull out of Syria, just said we want to do a handoff, which you think Assad would be like, oh, wonderful. That's a, that's wonderful news. I don't know what Assad sounds like. I'm just going to do a random accent here, but that's wonderful news. Oh, I'll get my country back. I'm going to make him sound like count fun count. We'll have one, two, three, four gassings as soon as America leaves. Ah, 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 ah. I mean, that's what Assad's sitting around doing when he hears that, that America's going to pull out, that he's won. Assad won. War over. ISIS beaten. Rebels destroyed. All of the, all of the land, all the territory is back in Assad's control. So why doesn't he gas his own people? But it makes perfect sense. And Trump, who's on record tweeting about it, 
criticizing Obama for bombing Syria, for being involved in Syria, for being involved in this civil war we don't need to be a part of, to overthrow another regime when Trump's pledged that he wouldn't get involved in regime change, but all it does is destabilize the region again and again and again from the time where we overthrew Iran's uh, current democratically elected leader to put in the Shah, who then was overthrown by the people because they hated him, to the time where we got Saddam Hussein out of there after we were friends with him for a long time, and then we decided that he's got to go. And then every time all these people come in, the terrorists come in, every single time, Afghanistan, lovely, how's that working out for us? Fantastic. So Trump criticizes this, and then just, yep, let's just bomb them again for no reason. Let's not, let's not look at any of the facts. No, let's not look at any of the logic or the reason behind an action. Let's not even suspect for a second that people that are there getting their asses stomped that have no other option than desperation like these rebel groups or like these bullshit white hat uh, brigade, brigade assholes that are completely complicit in gassing. Those are the people that are gassing their own people, period. We don't think that they're the ones doing this to keep America in there, to draw them in. And you know what I can't, I, here's what I can't stop thinking about. This has nothing to do with American interests. Nothing. And when you sign up for the military, do you, do you basically sign a, an agreement? Is there, is there a contract that you sign where you agree to exchange your life for the life of a random person across the world for no other reason than, well, we don't think that, that you know, what's happening to them is a good thing. I don't think there's. I don't think most of the people that sign up for the military are, are doing it to to go and get in deeply involved with humanitarian causes that mean absolutely nothing to them or their family. I don't think there's anything that that should explicitly state that that America's uh, trade ratio is one to one for every every uh, Syrian child gassed. We're going to go ahead and and sacrifice an American life in a pointless battle over there that has nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our security at home. And, you know, I give Dave Smith a lot of credit. He was on uh, that SE Cup show on uh, HLN and has the balls because Dave's an awesome dude, ballsy guy. I, I really enjoyed hanging out with him. And by the way, thank you all for coming out. I <laughs> I forgot I haven't been on air uh, or podcasting since we did have our meetup, the last one. But that was awesome. Thank you all for coming out. I had a great time talking to you. And uh, as many of you have remarked, uh, yeah, I, I'm the exact same in person as I am <laughs> As I am here, and uh, you will notice my voice. Hard to miss it, but uh, but Dave's a ballsy motherfucker, man, and that dude is who he is. Like he is when he tells you he is off when he's off the uh, the podcast and Mike, he is the exact same dude. And I like to see that he's the exact same dude on SC Cup Show because he called her shit out. She goes, "What should we do in Syria?" And he said, "Well, you know what? Uh, I don't I don't think what we should go and." And sacrifice, you know, like, he's like, we don't, we don't need to exchange American lives for these 70 kids. Like, you know, I'm sorry. It sucks that 70 kids died. And I'm paraphrasing him a lot here. I'm, I'm trying to remember what happened like a, four days ago now, but paraphrasing Dave, you know, wh- where does it say that these 70 kids died and now we have to go in and save them? Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The kids are dead, but why is that America's issue? And that is the question. Why is that America's issue? I'm sorry these kids died too, but every time a kid dies somewhere across the globe, we got to sacrifice an American life? I mean, that's the point I'm making. Your humanitarian cause is not reason that we need to sacrifice our lives for it. So all we're doing is instead of letting these people die, we're going to say, okay, well, we're going to die instead. Now, that's very noble, but that's not what people are signing up for. That's not what I want people in my military doing. That's not what I want Americans doing. That's that's not... That's not what I want for liberty. I mean, Christ, at the core of liberty is being alive. And if you're fucking dead, I don't think you can enjoy too much of your liberty, can you? So exchanging your life for some random dudes that happens to be getting his hand cut off or has to be getting gassed by somebody, yeah, no good. Not a fan of that. And now I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, you know, The powers that be, the war state, if it wasn't more obvious, is very prominent. Seeing the strings being pulled to keep people involved in Syria. We saw that all of Trump's people wanted to stay there. We saw that Mattis wasn't happy about him pulling out. We know uh, McMaster wasn't happy about it. We know all these people wanted to stay. We've got, <laughs> I mean, you've got now as Secretary of State, uh, the, just the worst. The worst in John Bolton. John Bolton probably made the call to the White Hats to have them gas their own people and blame it on Assad. He probably, he probably put his mustache just a, a little to the side, because God knows that thing's got to muffle that cell phone up. 
and told him to go ahead with the attack. Just keep us there. I mean, I, I just the curtain has been pulled aside. The curtain has been pulled aside. Oh, how about that? On this just despicable, despicable state that we live in and, and how things are never going to change. I thought under Trump, they might have a shot. But clearly, if we don't get somebody like Ron Paul in there, things are going to stay the exact same. All right, let's take a quick commercial break. Be back with a little bit more Electric Liberty Land. My name is Dale Kearns, and I'm running for United States Senate in Pennsylvania as a libertarian. I'm a concerned citizen who has had enough. I work as a project manager for an electrical contractor in southeastern Pennsylvania. There I manage large commercial and industrial projects. I'm a husband and a father of two energetic little girls. I'm running to advocate for a society where my girls have more liberty, not less. Will you support our campaign? Unlike my competitors, I'm not a career politician. I don't have millionaire and billionaire donors. I'm running for Senate in Pennsylvania because I want to take the message to Washington that we want government out of our lives. Will you let me be your voice? Let me be the voice that says we will not walk quietly down the road to serfdom. The voice that says we need free market solutions. The voice that says we need to end the failed war on drugs. The voice who will fight for the forgotten man, nonviolent offenders wasting away in prison, and addicts who are afraid to speak up and seek the help they need. We are seeking members for our campaign team. I encourage you to apply. We need donations to help us spread the message of liberty across the state. We can go on hoping for liberty to happen, or we can fight together. I hope you choose the latter and join me today. Find out more at DaleKearns.com. Paid for by Dale Kearns for Office. All right, welcome back to Electric Liberty Land number 68, everybody. As mentioned at the top of the show, you can find some of the show notes, links to the stories I'm talking about today at lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL68. And by the way, you know, you hear me talking about CASA of Los Angeles and, and CASA in general. I don't want to short shrift uh, our good friends over at Donor C, Greg Glyer and, uh, and Clint, Clint Rankin, excuse me, I said Clinton... <laughs> And Hillary Clinton Rankin and Clint Rankin over at Walk the Walk. Uh, you know, it's been too long since I gave them a shout out. And really, I got to find out what what current project we're working on, because those are the guys that we're teaming up with, gathering libertarians together for causes to solve. I mean, digging a well over in uh, Malawi, Malawi, uh, you know, one of those places <laughs> and building people's houses. You know, they said showing the libertarians do care, but for a good cause and really changing people's lives. So give them a quick shout out to it while I'm at it. All right, let's ease back into it. Uh, you know, and you also heard, by the way, Dale Kearns, who was awesome. You might have recognized the voice of that ad. That's uh, our own John Odermatt. And a quick update on Odie. As you know, we were supposed to be playing backwards. And Eric July, whose birthday was on Tuesday. Happy happy birthday uh, to Eric July. But we're supposed to be playing them in basketball at Porkfest, three on three. So Rico and I are getting in the prime condition, you know, the true athletes that we are. Meanwhile, Odie goes out, plays one time while he's playing with some of his uh, his brother-in-laws, breaks his fucking ankle. What a worthless chump. Actually, maybe he tore ligaments in his ankle, something like that. But talk about a letdown, man. You know, if we were real Lions, once he went down, once he got hurt like that, done, dead, leave him behind. That's it, man. You can't hunt, can't, can't eat, can't live. Leave him behind. Maybe you'll get lucky, find some uh, some carcasses of an old gazelle, come across some old uh, elephant testicles that the buzzards didn't want. That would be your lot in life, Odie. You're lucky, man. You're lucky more, we're more loyal than them lions. So anyway, that's a huge letdown. Now we got to figure out what we're going to do. Try to find someone else. Thinking maybe getting Howie all, all high on goofballs playing out there. Maybe you have to see if JB can... Figure out how to be black for a few hours. Mark Claire, uh, he's not going to play. He's, <laughs> he's not going to do it. <laughs> so I don't know. We're in the lurch. We're going to figure it out, guys. All right. You know what else needs to be figured out? London's murder rate. How about that? London's murder rate has surpassed New York City's murder rate. And that's despite the fact. I don't know if you guys know this. But, uh, you know, guns aren't legal there. But their issue doesn't have as much to do with guns as it does with people just being stabbed to death, which arguably is worse. I mean, if it's up to me, if I was going to choose to get stabbed to death 
or stabbed in general or shot. I probably would choose shot because a lot of times stabbings, when stabbings happen, that's an up close and personal thing. You know, when someone's stabbing you, they pretty much want you to die. And odds are you're going to be stabbed multiple times. This is just from knowing how stab wounds worked. I watch a lot of snapped when I'm hung over on Sundays, guys, on uh, Oxygen Network. You learn these things. You pick them up. But of 44 murders, this is this is even like a week old now. 44 murders, 31 of which are the result of stabbings. They're just, I mean, the, London's off the charts now as far as violence. And a lot of these are also machete attacks that have been, that have been happening throughout uh, England that are essentially an extension of kind of these terrorist terrorist attacks that are happening. But the point I want to make, and I think the point you knew I was going to make, is that owning guns has nothing to do w- with murder going up or down. And I would actually argue that owning guns would probably help murder rates go down, especially stabbings, because if you knew someone had a gun, uh, you probably wouldn't want to bring a knife to the gunfight. You know? It's like the old Crocodile Dundee, where, you know, the guy whips out a knife, and he goes, you call that a knife? This is a knife. And then he pulls out the big old Bowie knife. Now, if somebody pulls out a knife, kind of, or even better, even better movie reference. How about in Indiana Jones? I believe it's Indiana Jones and uh, the Ark, the Covenant. But the guy, they're in uh, the middle of, I don't know, Persia somewhere. And the guy whips out a sword and he's whipping around. And Indiana Jones pulls out his gun and fucking shoots the guy. There you go. Game over. So, you know what? Maybe if everybody in London had guns or had the ability to have a gun, you wouldn't have so many people getting stabbed to death constantly. But not only that, I've said this before on the show, and it is true, but even when you ban guns, your murder rate actually stays the exact same. Because violence and the urge to kill doesn't just go away when you get rid of guns. And in fact, (laughs) I don't think that could possibly go down and say it would be suicides because uh, I think more than half of gun deaths are via suicide anyhow. So if you get rid of guns, you would get rid of some of those gun related suicides. Now those people also could find other ways. You get overdose on pills, which probably would happen. Hey, that plays in perfectly with our opioid epidemic, right? Ties it in. Everybody wins, but you hang yourself. You fall off a bridge. You jump off thing. Like in Japan, they go in the suicide forest. They hang themselves. They cut the wrist. They jump off a bridge. People that want to kill themselves are going to kill themselves. People that want to murder people are going to murder people. And simply not having a gun to do it doesn't take away the drive to kill somebody. It it doesn't take away uh, finding somebody sleeping with your wife. It doesn't take away somebody finding somebody that had stolen from you for years and give you the the blood rage. It doesn't take away wanting to kill somebody for money, does it? No. And we're seeing that very clearly here. And, of course, London's response to this, Mayor, uh, was it, Sadiq, Sadiq Khan, something like that. You know me. I like to get names wrong. It's kind of my thing. But Khan now is saying that we need to have a crackdown on knives because there's no reason to ever carry a knife. (laughs) Now, I would argue with spiking murder rates, that's all the more reason to carry a knife, just as with carrying a gun, because maybe if I have a bigger knife, I'm not going to get stabbed to death when somebody tries to murder me or rob me or rape me. You know, that just kind of goes hand in hand with the way I think. But so this guy, what's he going to do? He's trying to ban knives now, ban sales of knives to people. The thing is, if you ban knives... People that like to murder people for fun, profit, or pleasure are just going to still get knives. And in fact, I'd say a knife's probably the easiest thing to get because you can't ban a butcher knife. (laughs) I I don't even understand how you would possibly facilitate a ban on knives. Are you only going to ban, what, hunting knives? Okay, then you go get a butcher knife. You go get a pen knife. You go sharpen a stick in the woods. See, I mean, how would I use a sharp rock? This is just, it's idiocy. It's idiocy to think that you can control what people's actions will be by curtailing the things that are available to them. That's simply stupid. It takes away every aspect of human condition, of motivation, of any of that, and says that, okay, we can live within a completely... It's like, it's like taking all the variables and life out. If we lived in a world in which no variables ever existed, if we lived on a flat plane of existence, then sure, maybe this would work. Maybe like in a video game, If you take away a bridge, then people go, ah, well, I'm screwed now. I can't go across this bridge. I mean, it's, I can only go left or right. This is a very 2D universe. I can't go backwards. I can't go outwards. I can't go upwards. I guess I'm just fucked. But that's not the world we live in. And taking away 
the 2D bridge that is the knives in the situation is not going to solve anything. And in fact, it's going to make everybody less safe. If you're a woman walking around, I'm sure you would prefer to have a knife. If they know there's no, no guns and no knives, and I guarantee you mace is already illegal, then well, who's to say that the rapes aren't going to go out? Who's to say others, other murders aren't going to go up and other muggings? Because that just gives the advantage completely to the big and the strong. If you're somebody with a large physical presence, you now have 100% advantage. Well, maybe there's some judo advocates out there that would disagree with me, but I'm sorry. I don't care how talented you are. There's a certain size advantage that people have where you can't compete. So if you have a certain size advantage over people, well, guess what? You win. And now London's mayor has essentially eliminated all of the options in which you might have had to protect yourself. So what are you going to do? You're going to go out of your way to get an illegal weapon. You're going to carry a butcher knife around. Maybe you get caught with that butcher knife. Now you go to prison. Now your kids don't have a mom. Now your kids get taken away. Now you can't get a job. Now you have to turn to crime and that ah, gets what you're back. To, you're back to carrying a knife. It's just, it's magically stupid. Just magically stupid. All right, let's go to another story. How about the Pulitzer Prizes just came out, huh? Do you see all these exciting Pulitzer Prize winners? What an impressive gaggle of fucks. Now, Politico's got a nice big story. And uh, I, I guess that they're proud of this, but they say the Pulitzer Prizes honor reporting on Trump Russia, <laughs> which is hilarious uh, on its face, and sexual misconduct scandals. Now, I do agree. The sexual misconduct scandal reporting, that was fantastic journalism. It's about time somebody did that. I told you guys a story before of uh, a woman that I uh, had worked with before in my public relations career named Sharon Waxman, formerly of the New York Times, now with The Wrap. She wanted to have a story come out basically saying the exact same things about Harvey Weinstein that this new writer said. However, all of the people that she talked to refused to corroborate the story, and she was pressured by people like Matt Damon. And, uh, and other scumbags of the industry that are uh, considered the golden boys was pressured to kill the story. And her paper, the cowardly New York Times, which has won several Pulitzers, agreed. Now, the New Yorker, you'll remember, is who published the Weinstein article. But they also are saying that, OK, Pulitzer Prize is on a reporting on Trump, Russia. I, I, how? how? I don't understand how you can honor reporting on Trump and Russia. When there's still no reporting there. I mean, I, are they honoring reporting for the sake of reporting? I mean, I can write words. I can have the monkeys at the typewriters type up a thousand words about Trump Russia. Eventually they'll type Trump Russia. Is just having random words and Trump and Russia in the context of those words what gets you the Pulitzer? I mean, shouldn't this be an article for short fiction? We still have no proof. Is it just telling people that there's investigations going on? Is that what the Pulitzer's for? I mean, to me, it seems like a Pulitzer should have been for actually accomplishing something, actually uncovering something. A Woodward Bernstein-style reporting. Uncovering some scandal, uncovering some... Uh, for example, I saw a great movie, highly recommend everybody watches it, on the plane ride back from Japan. It was called Kill the Messenger. And it was about the reporter who worked for uh, the San Jose Mercury News, Scott, uh, shit, I'm blanking on his name. I apologize. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to pop the, a link to the movie in the show notes. But it's essentially about the reporter who uncovered the Iran-Contra scandal and, uh, and, and uncovered all of the, the evidence of importing massive amounts of cocaine, working hand-in-hand -hand with the drug dealers, facilitating that into the black communities, working with the the, uh, the drug dealers on the local level, Ricky Ross, slinging it out. And, and this guy, I mean, my God, you got to watch this movie. If you don't know this story, this guy just got destroyed. He got ruined. And he wasn't ruined by the government. Do you know who he was ruined by? The media. The very same bunch of self-congratulatory assholes that are giving out these Pulitzers, that are, that are tapping themselves uh, and high-fiving over this Trump-Russia nonsense, 
They turned on this man who had uncovered a major scandal. They tore him to shreds because he had beat them to the punch in reporting it. The Washington Post, the New York Times, the LA Times, all these scumbag papers had torn him apart. They went after his personal life, which is, again, nothing to do with the story he was reporting on. But they uncovered the fact that he had slept with a woman that, uh, that had killed herself. They used that to try to ruin him, to pressure him, to back off. And the guy essentially retired uh, from journalism. I mean, you know, spoilers, this is, this is a, a biographical movie, so I'm not spoiling anything for you. You should still watch it. It's got Jeremy Renner in it. He's excellent in it. But just to watch these jackals turn on each other and feed on their own. Essentially, of course, the Washington Post has got their men. <laughs> and it's a great part of the movie. I, a libertarian must have written this movie, by the way. But they've got the people at the Washington Post talking to the CIA and uh, Jeremy Renner's character, Scott, he goes, oh, so, uh, so you guys talk to the guys at the CIA. And that's, your, that's who's saying that, that I'm full of shit. That's who's, that's who's not corroborating. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So you're going you're gonna to trust them. Okay, why would they ever agree? Why would they tell you? Oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> we totally did it. We totally have been bringing all, these, all this cocaine into the country and, uh, and working hand in hand with the drug dealers. I mean, just idiotic, idiotic shit. And the Washington Post to this day is still the CIA's organ so check that movie out guys but getting back to the point i was making pulitzer prizes given out for journalists who do absolutely nothing who accomplish nothing who reveal nothing other than to keep america in a in a fury over an irrelevant connection that was been invented by a bullshit fisa warrant that's what wins awards how about you some fucking real reporting? How about you talk about how many people the Clintons have killed? How about you talk about the Clinton Foundation taking millions and millions of dollars and helping Russia out with its nuclear interests, embezzling money from Haiti? Where's the Pulitzer for uncovering that? Well, you won't see that because that doesn't go after a Republican. Or that doesn't take pot shots at a libertarian. I would be, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they gave uh, the Vanity Fair writer who wrote that piece hooraying and huzzahing Rand Paul being tackled because what a jerk Rand Paul is, <laughs> a Pulitzer for this shit. I mean, what is the point of any of this anymore? I, I, that's what I keep coming back. What is the point? Mainstream media has gotten to the point where I, what, why even bother paying any attention to it at all, other than to mock it? It has become worse than the daily show the daily show has become worse than the daily show but the daily show is at least intentional humor in in giant quotation marks these mainstream media publications are, are satire without even being cognizant of the fact that they're satire and then they then they award themselves for it it's like the oscars except at least the oscars pretend to be entertaining it just blows my mind Okay, last thing I want to talk about as I sip on my calm myself down martini is that Backpage's founders were indicted on charges of facilitating prostitution. Of course, this ties in with the FOSTA bill we talked about on Electric Liberty Land's very special E-L-L-L-I-L-D-L drinking episode last time. This ridiculous sex trafficking bill, which is shut down all of these sites in which people that are just having voluntary interactions with other strangers for money and living on it, making very good livings, mind you, professionals were able to safely and securely advertise their services, set up screening programs, etc., by using the internet. Well, now all those people are going to be forced to go back to uh, simply walking the streets. So thanks a lot, politicians. And by the way, I'd love to see, I'd love to see these prostitutes get together and publish the names of every one of these pieces of shit who voted for this bill. Because you know every single one of them goes to prostitutes. Every single one of them. They should just threaten to do it. Threaten to publish. You can just write an anonymous letter to the New York Times. Say, we, the uh, United Prostitutes of Washington, D.C., the UPODC, we pledge to release a list of names of all of our clientele, should this bill not be immediately and unequivocally repealed. It would be repealed within days. That much I guarantee it. But in the meantime, 
We've got this idiotic shit moving forward. Backpage is down. Now, if you're not familiar with Backpage.com, and I have looked at it because, God, how can you hear so much about something and not at least take a look? So Backpage, if you've ever been there, they have all these kind of like a Craigslist, uh, but they've got a page explicitly for escort services, which, you know, and escort services have been living on the boundaries of legality forever because essentially what an escort is is supposed to be a woman that spends night with you and goes out as your female companion, especially as kind of like as arm candy, basically. And mm, escort has kind of become a phrase for prostitute though. But, you know, at some point you say, well, where's that line drawn? If a woman goes out with you, you're paying her to spend time with you and she enjoys your company and opts voluntarily, which is what she's doing, to have sex with you. Well, then I don't think that's any of your business, is it? It shouldn't be your business to begin with. But how is it even, how is it any of your business now? Two people having a voluntary relationship. Meanwhile, of course, as I think South Park or other people pointed out, if you simply pay her and say, I want to fuck you on camera and we're going to make a porno, that's legal. But, you know, if you do it in the privacy of your own home and you advertise it, that's that's illegal because that makes complete sense and isn't in any way hypocritical. So anyway, Backpages is down, and they're saying that they, they Backpages had to be taken down because their escort services were often uh, used to facilitate prostitution and money laundering. I don't know how they get money laundering out of it. I guess because they weren't really for escort services. It was for prostitution, so that's money laundering. And then they also say that these ads, a, a ton of these ads included children, an ad featuring the prostitution of a child, which, again, I looked just so I could talk about this shit, you know, like way back when this when this whole uh, I don't even know what you call it, investigation uh, witch hunt started, I looked at back pages just so I could take a look and talk about it. I didn't see any ads for kitty sex. I can tell you that much, guys. To me, it's well for the most part, <laughs> it looked like a bunch of ugly chicks that wanted to uh, have sex with drunk dudes for money. <laughs> it's about it's about the best I can sum it up. Uh, it didn't look like there are too many foxy mamas on there. I think they probably have a different process for the the high rollers. But I, uh, there were no children on there. In fact, I would say the very opposite. I'd say the average age, probably about 40, 45. So uh, this is, I don't know, know where they're getting this horse shit. You know, this is like cherry picking. But they indicted these people. Now they're going to go to jail. And they invited uh, indicted some seven people, the two founders who are 69 and 68, as well as shareholders and employees. And I, a shareholder gets indicted in this and these employees. And again, this is your quote. Indicting them, the uh, it accuses the executives of presenting back pages as a site to advertise escort services while knowing. And I don't know how you can say that they knew that the overwhelming majority of the website's ads involve prostitution. Again, I looked. None of these ads say, come over here and I'm going to fuck you. Not a one. Not a one. So I don't know how you possibly prove this charge other than this. This is just simply a witch hunt. I mean, they can indict these people. I don't know how they're going to possibly prove it. And this is what drives me nuts about this kind of legislation. You can't prove any of this shit. And now because of this, all these other services have fallen under the umbrella of this horrible act, which prevents them from taking certain advertisements, which means they have to hire on all these extra people to police everything the costs of advertising are going to go, going to go up because they have to have all these these watchdogs on constant vigil. Meanwhile, you've got sites like back pages, which people are using voluntarily, again, to get together, voluntary relationships, hurting no one. That's now shut down. And all the women that use that, who now they can't advertise on Craigslist, I don't know where they're going to go. I'm sure something else will pop up because, God damn it, this is America and that uh, ingenuity. Maybe it'll be a foreign site, but it'll be blocked from the U.S. Something will come up. But in the meantime, like I said, these women now have to go and streetwalk. So the odds of them getting murdered, like, hey, let's say uh, London Backpages, maybe maybe coincidentally, London Backpages, maybe they banned that too, and that's where the murder rate's skyrocketing. Because these people are just putting themselves in so much danger. And as I've said before as well, and I apologize, I'm repeating myself, but if you are somebody that likes to diddle kids Backpages.com going down ain't stopping you. If you have that specific fucked up drive, you're going to find a way to, to do that. Just like people who like to eat people, just like people who are fans of anything. I mean, any crazy, horrible fetish you have, 
which I'm fine with any crazy, horrible fetish you have, as long as it doesn't involve raping or kidnapping or torturing or murdering. Whatever else you're into, go for it, buddy. You got my full approval. But give me a break. To pretend this, it, to pretend it's to stop sex trafficking, of which maybe 0.001% of what's advertised on these sites has to do with. Just insulting. All right. Well, that is going to finish it up for this episode of Electric Liberty Land, guys. I'm going to wrap. My throat's giving out. I'm tired. I actually am shocked this went 50 minutes. I was intending on really giving you guys the time shaft and uh, and wrapping early, but you got lucky. My uh, <laughs> you got lucky. I was able to to collect myself and and get a little of my energy back while I was sitting in, in Kathy Hilton's <laughs> Kathy Hilton's driveway for uh, for an hour and 20 minutes or whatever it was. Listening to baseball. All right. So a reminder, guys, please do be sure to tune into our other shows. Mark Claire, Magic Mark on Mondays with his in-depth interviews with leaders of the libertarian movement. Of course, me on Wednesdays, Electric Liberty Land. John Brittlebones, Odor Matt on Fridays with Felony Fridays, his in-depth look at the criminal justice system. Make sure to check those out. They're fantastic shows, guys. And as I mentioned, please do, if you're in L.A. or you want to come out to L.A., meet up with Scott Horton, meet up with me, meet up with Mark, meet up with Jason Stapleton. We are going to be doing another meetup on May 5th in Hollywood. So uh, come on out. The last one was just such a crazy blast. I'm not sure how often we're going to do them. Once a month, maybe a little too much, honestly, for me, because uh, I'm am i running I'm running on empty, man. Move it out. Running on empty. I am running on empty. Though. I'm I'm just basically living off alcohol. So anyway, hope to get my life back soon. But in the meantime, meet up with me. Meet up with Mark. Meet up with Jason and Scott Horton. May fifth in Hollywood. And don't forget, you can support this show. Go ahead, toss us a five bucks. Thank you guys for come on recently. We've had some nice supporters come on there. Go to lionsofliberty.com forward slash support for uh, just pennies. Pennies on the dollar a day. You can join and get all sorts of extra content coming through from us, including my very own Degenerate Gamblers I did with Rico and Odie, where now you can hear some of the more interesting stories about my travels and uh, many, many other things. All right. I'll wrap it on that, guys. Peace out. Bye-bye from me, Brian McWilliams. Bye from Lions of Liberty. Adios from Electric Liberty Land, which reminds you to always stay plugged in to liberty. 